Today we'll be talking about another aspect of pirate combat, ranged weapons. Before I get into that, I'd like to say thank you to Flintlock for writing the amazing music in my intro. He has a channel on YouTube where he plays his mandolin, and if you enjoy mandolin music, I definitely recommend checking it out. The link for his channel is in the description below. We've already went over swords, knives, axes, and daggers, weapons that were designed for up close and personal combat. Along with cannons, pirates were also armed with pistols, muskets, and the blunderbuss for fighting from a distance. Pistols were commonly carried, and often a pirate would carry multiple pistols at the same time. It was also common for pirates to tie two pistols together with a silk ribbon and hang them over their necks. In film, it's often shown that a pirate would use their pistol and toss it aside, but this is not the case. These weapons were certainly not disposable, and once fired, they were secured in the pirate's belt or allowed to hang from a ribbon around the neck. If the pirate had the opportunity to reload, he would do so, preferring the ranged attacks instead of fighting with the sword. The pistol could also be reserved and used as a club once fired. I want to take a moment and explain how the flintlock mechanism, the most widely used in the age, worked. The weapon was loaded by first pulling the hammer back. Most flintlocks had a safety feature where the hammer would stop at a middle position and that was referred to as half cocked. If you rushed to shoot and left the hammer at this position, the weapon wouldn't fire and this is where the phrase going off half cock comes from. Next, the user pours a charge of black powder into the barrel, followed by a piece of cloth called a wad, and then by a lead ball. This is all tamped down with a ramrod, which is usually stored under the barrel. After this, the weapon needs to be primed. To prime the gun, the pirate lifted up a mechanism called a frizzen, which covered a section called the pan. The bottom of the pan had a hole that led into the barrel where the main charge of powder was located. A small amount of powder was poured in the pan, and the frizzen was closed down. Finally, the hammer was pulled all the way back, and the gun was ready for action. The musket was employed like a sniper rifle is today. The best marksman would be positioned high above the decks on a platform on the mast called the fighting top. From their positions, they would pick off targets of value like a helmsman, officers, or any armed resistance clearing the way for the boarding party. Muskets had barrels roughly three feet long and were accurate enough to hit a 20 by 20 inch square from 300 feet away with a maximum range of roughly 3,600 feet. They were smooth barreled, which meant the balls left the barrel without a spin, and consequently, the balls would often meander off target. Muskets were loaded the same way flintlock pistols were, and an experienced sailor could expect to get off between three and five shots per minute. They would also have preloaded multiple muskets and brought them into the fighting top so the sharpshooter could fire and reach for another musket and so on before needing to reload. Larger crews may have also had one or two boys with the shooter so he could fire while they reloaded the other guns. On deck, they were rarely employed due to their large size and heavier weight. The blunderbuss was more of a hand cannon than a rifle, and operated similar to a shotgun. They ranged in size from 14 to 30 inches, and the barrels were flared at the end like a funnel. It was thought that this shape would help spread the shot, but in reality it did little to help. It did, however, make the blunderbuss an interesting looking weapon. They had short stocks and were designed to be fired from the hip or from between the forearm and the side of the body to help with the recoil. Most blunderbusses did not even have sights on them, as they were designed for very close ranges. They fired small pellets and had a bore of one and a half to two inches. Blunderbusses were used as one-shot weapons and were primarily used while boarding, before discarding them and drawing a sword. Granados, stink pots, and powder flasks were employed during boarding as well. Granados were hollow spheres made from iron, glass, and wood. They were about the size of a softball with a hole so a fuse can be inserted. The granada was filled with gunpowder, a piece of cork or wood was stuffed into the hole to keep the powder from spilling out, and a piece of slow match was inserted through the center. Sometimes pirates would add bits of iron, nails, or pellets, because often the granada would crack along the casting line and only split into two fragments. This way, the weapon would explode with more damage. On other occasions, scraps of iron, glass, or nails would be stuck on the outside using tar or wrapped in cloth for the same reason. Powder flasks were clay pots filled with either flammable liquids like turpentine or whale oil, or powder and glass and iron scraps. Flammable liquids were not used often, as a fire in a ship could potentially sink it, or worse, spread to the other ship. Stink pots were pots or bags filled with rotting animals or substances like sulfur or ammonia, which would irritate the lungs, throat, and eyes. They would be thrown below deck or into cabins and were designed to force people out. Think of stink pots as the flashbang grenades of the day. They weren't meant to kill people, and were likely used if the pirates wanted somebody captured alive. The last weapon that I'll talk about today is one of the strongest weapons that a pirate would have had, terror. There were many rumors about pirates, some true, some not. 
and the sight of a Jolly Roger and a bunch of heavily armed pirates would have struck fear into any sailor. Pirates were well known in their day, and seeing the flag of Blackbeard or Bartholomew Roberts would have been enough to almost always guarantee a crew's surrender. Blackbeard went to great lengths to cultivate his image. He stuck slow match under his hat and in his beard, so he appeared to be a demon straight from hell. Sailors in the golden age of piracy were very superstitious, and some would have believed Blackbeard actually was from hell. The sailors would have also heard about how pirates ruthlessly kill and torture crews that put up a fight, but more importantly, would have heard that more often than not, pirates were quite hospitable to a crew that handed over the loot with no problems. If you liked this video today, please subscribe and give us a like. Curious to learn more? Join our Discord community where I post historical documents, answer questions, and share resources. You can also catch us over at the Golden Age of Piracy subreddit. We also have a link to our PayPal and Patreon below, and if you can help out, that'd be very much appreciated.